All right, let's return to that simple diagram that I've given you of the general movement of both Hobbes and Locke's uh, political philosophy. They have a social contract theory, uh, and according to that theory, human beings start off in what they call this state of nature. It's prior to any political community. And then they uh, find themselves in a political community. They transition out of the political community or out of the state of nature into a political community. We've spent considerable time now looking at uh, the state of nature. Now we're going to look at the transition out of the state of nature into the political community. And there are two questions that we're going to uh, address uh, that Locke addresses. First, how does this work? How are we able to get out of the state of nature and into a political community? And second, why would we want to do that? When we considered, uh, we didn't consider these two questions explicitly when we were looking at Hobbes, but with Hobbes, the tricky question was the first one. It was really obvious when we were looking at Hobbes why you'd want to form a political community because the state of nature was so awful. The tricky part was how do we do that? Yeah, and he gave his theory, his uh, count of covenants, and you designate somebody as the authority and so on. Turning to Locke, the tricky question is going to be the second one. Why would you want to do that? And the first question we'll deal with fairly briefly. It's fairly straightforward. Locke actually doesn't say all that much about it. It's not a particularly complicated answer. But it's the second question that's trickier for Locke. And it's trickier precisely because, the state, because of his differences from Hobbes. For Locke, the state of nature is, it seems, not to be so terrible. It's not a state of war, he tells us. Um, there's this law of nature that people can figure out just using their reason, which prohibits them from murdering and stealing and, and so on. And so the state of nature is not a state of license. But then that raises the question, well, why would we ever want to leave the state of nature then, if it's so Edenic, if it's so perfect? We're going to tackle these questions in order. So let's first look at how political communities are formed. Locke's answer is straightforward, through what he calls consent. So he doesn't use the word covenant. That's what Hobbes would have said. It's through a covenant, a very particular kind of covenant. That's how the Commonwealth is formed, Hobbes would say. Locke wants to say political community, political society might be his preferred term. But political community is formed through consent, a very particular kind of consent. What he has in mind when he's talking about consent in this context is an agreement to form a community in which the majority of that community have the right to act on behalf of the whole community. So you agree to join this group. And the, uh, one of the, the main feature, primary feature of this group is that whatever a majority of this group decides, that's what the whole group will do, right? That's how he envisions the political community. And so the whole group will do it. Like it'd be, uh, we'll talk about the difference uh, between the whole, uh, well, we'll get into some of the differences or distinctions is the word I'm looking for, that he's going to draw uh concerning agreements that the group makes um uh, in just a second but to understand what is going on here um let's return to our state of nature let me illustrate it again right so these are the three people that we had in the state of nature when we were looking at hobbes so let's imagine now they're back in a state of nature when we were looking at hobbes it was kind of tricky how do these guys get out of the state of nature they'd like to uh because everyone's murdering everybody else uh, they'd like to get out of the state of nature. How do they do it? And they come up with this elaborate scheme where they lay down their rights in nature and they designate a Leviathan. With Locke, it's much more straightforward. How do they do it? They just all agree to join a community where the majority have the right to act on behalf of the whole. That's it. They don't need a king. And if the guy who would be king comes along, do they need him to be king? No, we don't need a king. Don't need it. You can join our community if you like. Right? If you agree to join a community wherein the majority have the right to act on behalf of the whole, great, come along, join us. 
but we don't need to designate some other person, some person outside of this agreement as the authority to enforce the agreement. That's just not how it works, according to Locke. Rather, the people, however many people, just come together and agree to make a community. And boom, you got a community, right? So it's much more straightforward with Locke. And I think Locke would want to say, well, how can you make sure that people are going to keep up their end of the bar? Well, how can you make sure? Well, what, are, what, you know, what were some of the problems? With the state of nature, as Hobbes was telling it, people are going to, you know, I'm not going to trust you. You're just going to steal my stuff. You're just, and so we need this Leviathan to enforce um, uh, the covenant. But with Locke, the problem's not so dire as that. Like, okay, yeah, so maybe uh, one of those guys is going to steal from somebody else. Well, that's a violation of the law of nature, and the state's just going to punish it. No, no problem right? People violate the law of nature and then they get punished. Everyone else has the right to punish transgressions of the law of nature. One of the things we're going to see when you enter a political community, you give up that right. You cede that right to the state, to the political community. But um, so it's not as, you know, it's not as tricky for Locke is basically what I'm trying to say. Okay. Uh, go back to what we were just looking at. <clears throat> Locke spends most of his time in this, uh, in, in, in this particular, well, when he's talking about consent, he spends most of his time um, in the consent to form the political community, kind of distinguishing consent to form the political community from the majority decisions of the political community. And these are two very different things. And it's very easy to get tripped up by this distinction. What Locke says is that universal consent is required to join the, is for the political community. That means what he says when he's talking about universal consent, every member of the political community must consent to be a part of that community. If somebody doesn't consent to agree upon, to be a, uh, doesn't consent to be a part of the community, they are not a part of the community and they are not subject to that community. They are not subject to the majority decisions of that community. Every member of the political community then must consent to be a part of that political community. If they don't, they're simply not a part of it. It's that simple. And so there will be universal consent to be a part of the political community among the members of the political community. The act of the whole, however, does not require universal consent. This is what's tricky to keep in mind. So there needs to be universal consent to be a part of the community. Everybody has to agree to that. But when you agree to that, what you're agreeing to is to be part of a community where the majority, so not everybody, right? It doesn't have to be unanimous. Just whatever the majority decides, that's what we go with. Whatever the majority decides, you don't, the community doesn't need universal consent for that, right? Because the whole point of the community is that, well, whatever the majority decides, that's what we're going with. So, for example, to go to war with France or to make other, some other you know, similar such uh, foreign policy decisions, universal agreement to do so is not needed. Only majority support is required. To use the political community to do something, to have the political community act in some way, requires only majority agreement. You need universal agreement among the members of the community to join the community, to have the community, yeah? But once you're in the community, you don't need universal consent to make the community do something, right? Uh, you can think of it like this. maybe. Maybe you and a bunch of friends get together and agree to join like a, a movie watching club. Well, to be a part of that club, everybody has to agree. And if somebody didn't agree, well, then they're just not part of the club. And so there's universal consent to join the club. But then once you're in the club, the way you decide which movies to watch is you just take a simple vote and majority war. And, you know, so whatever most people want to watch, that's what we're going to watch, right? So most people want to watch... Uh, you know, uh, uh, what, Trolls 2? Well, that's what you're watching. 
that doesn't require universal consent, right? So the majority, the club then shows trolls too, because that's what the majority wanted to watch. Um, you don't need universal agreement for that, right? You're still a member of the club if you agree to be part of the club, but then you just go along and watch Trolls 2 even though you think it's stupid because you're part of the club and that's what everybody else wants to watch, right? That's how the political community works, according to Locke. You need to agree to join, but then once you join, it's not as though every decision the community makes needs universal consent, right? You just need majority consent or majority agreement. 